Anybody ever hear that song? Yeah. He's done. Can you, do you ask that? anyone who celebrates Christmas where Christ was born, and many, if not all, will respond. That's one, that's one. Thank you. Let's, let's try one more time. They will respond. <laughs> Thank you. Amen. Yes. Carols like a little town of Bethlehem, written by Pastor Philip Brooks back on December 24th, 1865, when he was in Israel uh, overlooking Bethlehem, really makes and celebrates the town. And who of us can forget? Linus's famous words when Charlie Brown came out and said, can somebody, isn't there anyone who understands what Christmas is all about? To which Linus responds, sure, I can tell you what Christmas is all about. And then he begins to recite from Luke chapter 1. And I want to read that passage of scripture to you this morning. Around the time of Elizabeth, amazing pregnancy and John's birth, the emperor in Rome, Caesar Augustus, required everyone in the Roman Empire to participate in a massive census. This was a miracle in itself. Just out of nowhere, the Roman <laughs> governor decides, I'm going to have a census, and usually that's for the purpose of taxation. And all of a sudden, he just decides, oh, I'm going to have a census, and everybody has to go back to their hometown from which they were born. Coincidence? The first census since Cornelius, the, the first governor of Syria, each person had to go to his or her, or her ancestral city to be counted for taxes. Mm -hmm. Mary's fiancé, Joseph, from Nazareth in Galilee, had to participate in the census in the same way everyone else did. Because he was a descendant of King David, his ancestral city was where? Bethlehem. 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 David's birthplace. Mary, who is now late in her pregnancy, uh, that the messenger Gabriel had predicted, accompanied Joseph. And while in, where? That's Bethlehem. Bethlehem. She went into labor and gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in swaddling clothes, in linen, in a blanket, and laid him in a feeding trowel because the inn had no room for them. So a census goes out, Roman emperor just decides, I'm going to have everybody go, I want to know uh, where everybody's at because I'm governing over this land. And just by coincidence, it happens that Mary and Joseph have to go to Bethlehem, and it's while she's there that suddenly she gives birth to Jesus. Nearby in the fields, outside of Bethlehem, a group of shepherds were guarding their flocks from predators in the darkness of night. Suddenly a messenger of the Lord, probably Gabriel, stood in the front of them, and the darkness was replaced by a glorious light, the shining light of God's glory. They were terrified. The messenger said, don't be afraid. Listen, I bring good news, news of great joy, news that will affect all people everywhere. Today in the city of David, a Savior, a Liberator has been born for you. <laughs> Shepherds, they're the first ones that get this message from heaven about the birth of Messiah, Jesus, who's been born in a feeding trap. Today in the city of David, a liberator, Savior, has been born for you. He is the promised anointed one, the supreme authority. And the sign, can you say the sign? The, the sign. sign. To you is this, you will find an infant wrapped in strips of cloth and swaddling cloths or clothes, laying or lying in a feeding trough. At that moment, a heavenly messenger was joined with thousands of other messengers, a vast heavenly choir, and they praised God. To the highest heights of the universe, glory to God, and on earth peace among all people who bring pleasure to God. As soon as the heavenly messengers disappeared into heaven, the shepherds were buzzing with conversation. Let's rush down to where? Bethlehem. Right now. Let's see what's happening. Let's experience what the Lord has told us about. So they ran into town, and eventually they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a feeding trough. And after they saw the baby, they spread the story of what they had experienced and what had been seen by them uh, about this child. Everyone who heard this story couldn't stop thinking about it. It's meaning Mary, too, pondered all of these events, treasured 
each memory in our heart. The shepherds returned to their flocks, praising God for all they had seen. Can somebody say seen. Seen. seen? They saw it with their own eyes and heard, and they glorified God for the way the experience had unfolded just as the heavenly messenger Gabriel, Gabriel had proclaimed. Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Bethlehem, over and over and over, we hear about Bethlehem. We're doing a series called The Christian, uh, the Christmas Connection. And this morning, we want to ask the question, why Bethlehem? How is Bethlehem connected to the Christmas story? Father, we thank you again for your word, and we ask that your word would go forth, be glorified, that Jesus, again, you would be magnified Hallelujah. and glorified. In your name, we ask in that. <laughs> Why Bethlehem? Real quick, just some points. It's a city of astounding productivity. It's amazing that when you go back and you research Bethlehem, you go back to its origins. It was first named Epaphra. Epaphra. Epaphra means to bear fruit, to, to give in abundance, to almost like a woman giving labor. That's the symbolism of this town. That's the origins of this town. It's a, a city in the ancient uh, town of Judah in Israel. And Epaphratha is also the name of a woman who, married, who was married to Caleb, the great Old Testament man of faith, who was ready to go to the promised land. But others, I don't know if you remember Caleb, he was ready to go in there. And others said, no, we're not going to go. We're too scared to go in there. But Caleb was a man of faith who went in there. He was married uh, to a woman who then gave birth to a son named her in this town. She, she gave birth to a, a famous son named her. Ever hear the movie Ben Hur? It's kind of based off of this man. So she gave birth in Epaphrata, in this place that's very fertile, this region that is known agriculturally for bearing a lot of things. Now we have a woman giving birth to a, a man named her. The Papa is also the famous uh, place where Rachel, I don't know if you remember where Rachel, Jacob's wife, she was there and she gave birth to a famous patriarch named Benjamin in the Papa. You get the connection here? A woman married to Caleb gives birth to a famous man named her. Then all of a sudden Rachel, she gives birth to another famous patriarch, Benjamin. And when she dies, she's buried in Epaphratha as, as well. And it's also uh, a wonderful place where things are just beginning to rise and, and more life is being given. Anybody ever hear of Naomi and Ruth? Yeah. Yes. Naomi and Ruth were in the land of Moab, about 50 miles away from Bethlehem. And Naomi's husband dies, Ruth's husband dies, and they decide to come together. And Ruth is not going to leave Naomi, who's a Jewish woman. She decides to go back into her homeland, which is in Jerusalem. She goes back to Bethlehem. And when she goes back, Naomi travels with her. I'm sorry, Ruth and Naomi go together, and they come back to Bethlehem. And Naomi doesn't want her daughter-in-law to be single. And she wants her to get married, but she wants her to find a nice Jewish guy. And she finds Boaz, and then she teaches Boaz, this is what you have to do in order to get married to this Jewish man. So ultimately, fast forward, Ruth and Boaz get married. And they give birth to a son in Bethlehem. His name is Obed. Obed then gets married later on in life. And he and his wife have a son whose name is Jesse. Born in Bethlehem. Jesse then gets married. And they have eight kids. The youngest one is named David. Amen. Born in Bethlehem. Oh, yes. Wow. Incredible. Amen. So Naomi, Ruth, Ruth is actually the great grandmother of David, who would then become king of Israel. Amen. Born in Bethlehem. Wow. You see all this birth that's going on? Yes. Really, from the early stages on, it's a, it's a productive place, not only fertile land, but anybody who gets in there, I'm not going to say women, if you need to get pregnant, go over there to Bethlehem. Pastor <laughs> <laughs> John, you're crazy. Yes. 
guess certain times people would call me crazy. <laughs> they told the Apostle Paul, much learning hath made thee mad. I don't know if I'm there yet, but praise God. <laughs> but you see this connection that's going on. Ruth and Boaz have a child named Obed. Obed and his wife have a child named Jesse. Jesse and his wife have a child named David. David. And you know what happens? Does anybody know who's supposed to come out of the line of David? Jesus. Jesus. God said that from the family of David, I'm going to raise up for you a righteous branch. And this individual is going to come from David, this incredibly anointed patriarch who was also born in Bethlehem. Someone said arguably one of the biggest names in the Old Testament is that of King David. David is the greatest of kings, a military strategist beyond compare, and the author of many of the Psalms. More than anything else, David is described as a man after God's own heart. God raised up David because he wanted to show a type of what Messiah would be like, a man after God's own heart. And so the city of Bethlehem is also called the city of David because David ended up buying all this land for himself. Israel is David's city. Remember, Linus said it was the city of David, according to Scripture. And so look at the what's going on once again. So Ruth and Boaz, they have a child. Who then ha they have a child. Who then the other has a child, and ultimately David comes out, and that's the direct link to Messiah, Jesus. This is what God said to David: Your dynasty, your kingdom, will stand perpetually in my sight. Your descendants will rule continually. God spoke through the prophet Jeremiah, and He said, "Behold, the days are coming," declares the Lord, "when I will raise up for David a righteous branch." This is talking about someone who's going to come, mm -hmm. Messiah. And he shall reign as king, and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called, the Lord, our righteousness. Amen. That's kind of interesting. God never refers to someone else as Lord. He's always the Lord. But suddenly he's saying, there's somebody that's going to come to earth. He's going to reign as king. And his name is going to be the Lord. Wow, isn't that interesting? Wow. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. We can't wrap our minds around the Trinity. But here in the Old Testament, God is giving us a glimpse that he is going to leave heaven. He's going to come down to this earth. And he is going to manifest himself in human form through the incarnation. And he's going to show himself to the world. The Lord, our righteousness. And this is what the angel even told Mary, remember we've been going through this for a couple of weeks. When Gabriel appeared to Mary, he said, Jesus will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. Has to come from this ancestral line. Has to come from the line of Judah and from David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. Now let me ask you something. How many presidents do you know that their kingdom goes on forever? Eternally. Right? Nobody. We're talking about someone who is beyond the natural into the supernatural. We're talking about the Lord coming down. This is his kingdom. This is God coming down to earth. And he's saying that there's going to come a time when I'm going to rule and reign over the earth and I will be king and master forever and forever and forever and Praise forever. God. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. He's the son of David. And this connection to Bethlehem is also connected to an ancient prophecy. This is where we get into the prophecy of Micah. Remember that during the time that Jesus was born, there were certain individuals called the Magi, the wise men over here that. And they came to King Herod. And this is what it says in Matthew's account. Uh, Jesus was born in the town of Bethlehem in the province of Judea. At that time, King Herod reigned. Not long after Jesus was born, Magi, wise men, or seers, from the east, made their way from the east to Jerusalem. And these wise men made their inquiries. They said, where is the newborn, this newborn, who is now king of the Jews? For we have seen... Uh, we are from the east and have seen a star 
and we have followed its glistening gleam of light. We've come here. We're inquiring, where is this king of the Jews? Now they're asking this question to King Herod. King Herod, historically, if you go back and you read a little about him, was a very ruthless man who didn't want anyone to usurp his authority. He killed people who even came close, family members in America, just brutal. So for him to hear that there's another king that's going to replace him, he got pretty upset. And that's why the Bible says that when Herod began to hear rumors of the wise man's quest, he and all of the followers of Jerusalem were worried. They got upset. Uh-oh, there's a replacement out there, you mean? There's somebody who's going to come and replace me as the king of the Jews? And who are these guys coming out here, these wise men from the east? They're talking about seeing the star, probably astrology. Somehow fits into there with the numbers, 24, 17. And they're saying that this king of the Jews has arrived. And they've come to replace. Uh, so Herod says, oh, you do me a favor. Um, you, when you find out, you come and let me know where he is so I can come and worship him too. Yeah. Herod had no intention of going to worship Jesus. No. Matter of fact, later on we find out that Herod sends out squadrons into this place and he kills every child to and below because he did not want any child to be there to usurp his authority. We saw that was incredible too. But Herod decides, let me call the leading Jewish teachers, the chief priests and the head scribes, and let me ask them about this thing, about Messiah, where he's supposed to be born. And the leading teachers at that time, the Jewish teachers and the chief priests and the head scribes, they came back with this answer. They said, uh, Hebrew tradition claimed long uh, the awaited Messiah would be born. An ancient Hebrew prophet, Micah, said this, but you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah are no poor relation Epaphatha is in there too, in the other version. For from your people will come a ruler who will be shepherd of my people, Israel. Mm. So King Herod is saying, show me, is there supposed to be a connection here? And the leading priests and the Jewish individuals, they, they come and they tell him, there's a prophecy that was given by this prophet, Micah, 700 years earlier. And this prophet <coughs> said that there's going to come a ruler out of Bethlehem, Epaphrathah. And this ruler is going to govern the people of Israel. Now Herod's really worried. That's why he sends the squadrons out to kill, because now he knows this is a prophecy given by a prophet, and if God says it, it's going to happen. And so he gets worried, and he sends everybody out. But notice it's a Jew Jewish priest that are telling him about this person that's going to come and rule over Israel. Dr. Uh, Swindoll said the book of Micah provides one of the most significant prophecies of Jesus Christ's birth in all the Old Testament, pointing some 700 years before Christ's birth to his birthplace of Bethlehem and to his eternal nature. Mm -hmm. This is just one of over 300 prophecies that Jesus fulfilled when he came here. Ask any mathematician the law of probability for one man to, to fulfill all 300 prophecies. And he will tell you that the odds for one person to fulfill all these 300 prophecies is 10 to the 17th power. Wow. 10 to the 17th power for one man to fulfill all 300 prophecies. That's miraculous. Amen. Yeah. Then this man, Peter Stoner, you can look it up, the scientific view of the birth and the life of Jesus and all the prophecies he fulfilled. He gave an illustration of what it would be like for one man to fulfill all 300 prophecies. And he said, imagine having the state of Texas filled with silver dollars, two feet high. He says, fill up the whole state of Texas with two feet high of silver coins, right? Then he said, have one person go, pick one coin, put an X in the coin, have him go in a helicopter, fly all over the state of Texas, throw it out at random anytime he wants to do it, anywhere he wants to do it. Have him land the helicopter down, blindfolded, have him walk over the sea of coins, go down and pick up that one coin that he marked. He said, that's the chances of one man fulfilling just eight of the prophecies, I should say, of the 300 prophecies. Yeah. Yeah. 10 to the 17 pounds. This is a miracle beyond miracles. Yeah. 
that is happening. But that's God. Amen. You see, when God comes out, he wants to show himself strong. Yes. Amen? Amen. Amen? When God touches somebody who's near death and heals them, and suddenly they walk out of the hospital, that's God saying, hello. Yes. When God even raises the dead, that's God saying, hello, it's me. Yes, I exist, and I do things supernaturally because I am a supernatural working God. When God touched you and when he saved your soul, you know what he was saying? Hello, it's me. I've done this in your life. There's no possible way you could have saved yourself. There's no possible way you saved yourself when you were trying to pull the trigger and suddenly there were no bullets or the gun was jammed and it didn't go off. It was me when you were trying to put that needle in your arm and suddenly... The dope that you stuck up your arm didn't work. It didn't kill you. All the pills that you took that you tried to kill yourself, it didn't work. Hello. <laughs> it's me. Glad to meet you. That's God. That's the miracle working power of God. He does things supernaturally. And sometimes he has to do audacious things in order to capture our attention because we're running so far away from him that he has to do something absolutely extraordinary to grab our attention. Yes, he does. That's what he did with me. I don't know about you. I was this close. Yeah. This close. Yeah. Literally one day away from living a life that many of you would not be able to fathom or comprehend. One day, and I went to the back of the church, and I prayed. And I said, God, you know What's going to happen tomorrow? Jesus. I'm going to make that call, and that's it. My life is going to change forever, mm. and I'm going to do the most abominable, horrible, wicked things on planet Earth with my family. And if you're real, make yourself known. Yes. Because if you don't, I am going to be the most wicked, vile person this Earth has ever seen. Mm. And I know, in my heart of hearts, it would have taken place. But when I was leaving that day, something supernatural happened, and I felt like 10,000 pounds had been lifted off of my shoulders. And when that happened, I looked up and I said, hello. <laughs> I said, you're out there. You just heard what I just prayed. Amen. Because, man, you know where I was headed. Amen. And you know exactly what I was going to do. And you know how many lives would have been lost had you not intervened right now at this moment. Can somebody say hello? Hello. Hello. Oh, <laughs> thank God for the hellos. Amen. Yes. Every morning when we wake up, God is saying hello. Yes. When the sun comes out and there's brilliance or all this glory on our faces, it's God saying, I am blessing you today. When we have air that we're breathing, we're able to walk and talk and move, it's God constantly saying, I am feeding you this breath. It's my gift to you. Every good and every precious and perfect gift is coming down from me. Amen. Yes. We don't take anything for granted. Yes. 700 years before Jesus appeared, there was a prophecy saying exactly that he would be born in a specific town, in a specific place. Mm -hmm. It was a place, this Bethlehem of productivity. It was a place, place of an ancient patriarch. And this place where the prophecy went off as well. But it was also another place. It was a city of allegorical principles. And what do I mean by that? This place, Bethlehem, man, I never saw it except for a few weeks ago. I've been studying the Bible over and over and over again for over 30 years. And it's amazing to me that when you're studying the Bible, God will just begin to reveal things to you like you've never seen them before. Let's go back to that prophecy for a second in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, Epaphrathah. Can somebody say Epaphrathah? Epaphrathah. I've read this a million times before. I've read this prophecy a million times before. But you, Bethlehem Epaphrathah, remember that's the name of the city, to be fruitful. Remember how we talked about in the beginning, productivity, birthing place, right? I, I've never seen this Hebrew word before, 
Never really gave it much thought until a couple of weeks ago when the Lord says, study this word. And I began to study this word. In the Hebrew, it's a place that David owned in Bethlehem. It's actually, Micah talks about there's towers in this place. It's called the Towers of the Flock. Okay? And there's towers, and this land was owned by David in Bethlehem. Epaphrath, that was a part, a parcel of Bethlehem. And there's this little parcel of land, and David says, you know what? I'm giving this parcel of land to the priests, to the Levit Levitical priests. Anybody know what the Levitical priests did with the sacrifices in the temple? So there was a group of priests that their whole job was just to look at the little baby lambs. They were to raise lambs, look at the lambs, find an unblemished, perfect lamb, and they were to take that lamb, and then when Yom Kippur came, when Passover came, any time that there was a requirement to give an animal sacrifice to God, right? That's what God required, this little lamb innocent, to say, listen, this lamb is going to take your place. You should be the one that's dying, but I'm going to let this little lamb suffer in your place. And the high priest would put its hand upon this little lamb, and he would pray that the, the sins of the people would be transferred onto this lamb, and this little lamb's neck would then be, I'm sorry to be so graphic, their neck would be cut, and the blood would gush out. It was all symbolic to say, this lamb is taking your place. Yes. My wrath is falling down on this little lamb who's innocent. Yes. And it really should be you, because I'm a holy and I'm a righteous God. Yes. And really, you should be dying, but instead, I'm going to make atonement for your sins through the blood of this little lamb. Yes. And there was this place called Epaphratha, and in this Epaphratha, there was a place called Migdal Ider. Can you say Migdal? Migdal. Ider. Ider. Hebrew word. You just learned Hebrew. You're scholars now. Praise the Lord. <laughs> you just went to rabbinic school. <laughs> Shalom. <laughs> So there's this little place, and Midal Eder is a place of the towers where all these little lambs would be brought. They would raise these little lambs there. And there were shepherds, Levitical shepherds, who actually were in charge of looking over this tower, looking at these little lambs, because these little lambs couldn't break their legs. They, they had to be absolutely perfect for the sacrifice. So there's this one little place specifically ordained for little lambs to be raised and brought to fullness so that the high priest would then come and examine this little lamb and then he would take it to be sacrificed. Alfred Irishman, the great Jewish Christian, Hebrew Christian scholar in the 1800s, said the Migdal was the watchtower which guarded sheep raised and destined to serve as sacrificial lambs in the temple. And the shepherds who kept them were not ordinary shepherds, but Levites who were specifically trained for this royal task. Wow. When the angel appeared to shepherds, he was appearing to Levitical priests yes. who were guarding Megal Eder, who were watching over these little sheep. Isn't that incredible? These little baby lambs. Dr. Jimmy DeYoung says, the lower part of the tower looked like a cave. It was here that the birthing of lambs would take place. The shepherds would then wrap the newborn lamb in strips of cloth, swaddling cloth, to protect it from injury or blemishing themselves. When the Bible says, nearby, when the angel came nearby in the fields outside of Bethlehem, it's Migal Eder. Wow. It's Miguel in the place of the towers. The angel is appearing to these shepherds who are Levitical priests who were watching over these little baby lambs. That's where the miracle was happening, right there in Miguel Eder. I never saw it before. Bethlehem, Epapratha. Out of you, out of you shall come forth unto me a ruler. Out of you, Amen. Jesus was born in Miguel Eder. Jesus was brought into that tower when there was no room for them in the inn. They brought, they brought Jesus right to that tower where the baby lambs would be birthed. And Jesus was birthed right in the same place where the sacrificial lambs would be given. And they wrapped Jesus in swaddling clothes. And it's no wonder when the angel said the sign, this shine shall be unto you. You will find an infant wrapped in swaddling clothes. When the Levitical priests and shepherds went 
to that cave and they saw the baby Jesus wrapped up in the very place where the lamb would be born in order to be taken and brought to the land of Christ and sacrifice. They saw Jesus there wrapped up. And it all came together. This is the Messiah. This is the one who is going to die for the sins of the world. He is birthed in the very feeding trough that the little baby lambs that are going to be sacrificed in the temple. Jesus is born in the bed. I never saw it before. Jesus born in that very place. Coincidence? Did somebody say hello? Hello. God manifests himself in such a beautiful, glorious, supernatural way. And the first people to see baby Jesus are the shepherds, the Levitical priests, who are constantly taking care of lambs, watching one lamb after another after another be sacrificed for the sins of the people. And it's no wonder when John the Baptist appears on the scene and he sees Jesus, what does he say? Behold the Lamb of God Amen. who taketh away the sins of this world. The, this, is the, this is the ultimate Lamb of God. He's in the feeding trap and the shepherds are seeing this for the very first time. This is the sign. It's no wonder that the angel says, don't be afraid. Listen, I bring good news. News of great joy. News that will affect all people everywhere. That news is still affecting people everywhere today throughout the world. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> today. Somebody say today. Today in the city of David in Bethlehem, in Migal Ador, in Bethlehem, Epaphratha, in that little place, a Savior and Liberator has been born for you. Amen. For you. Thank you, Jesus. And wow. for me. Yes. Amen. 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 Thank God that Jesus came the way he came Amen. in order to open our eyes to say, this is the sacrifice, this is the Lamb of God who is going to go to the cross to die for our sins, your, your sins and my sins. Why Bethlehem? Because it's in Bethlehem, that a little baby was wrapped in swallowing clothes in the very place where that little lamb that was going to be sacrificed was wrapped in cloths as well. And ultimately, Jesus would be taken out of there, and that crib would be transformed into a cross one day. And he would spread out his arms and die for the sins of all individuals. So that we wouldn't have to be lost and that we wouldn't have to be eternally separated from God. Some people don't understand that they're separated from God. Some people don't understand what the Bible says. Your sin has separated you from your God. And the only thing to atone for that sin and to make you right and to make me right was a sacrifice that was made on the cross at Calvary over 2,000 years ago Jesus. when the precious blood of the Lamb of God was shed for you and for me. When Jesus took the wrath of God on himself for you and for me. Amen. Wow. We're talking about the connection to Christmas. Elizabeth and Zechariah and John the Baptist had a connection to, to Christmas. Remember that a few weeks ago we talked about how 400 years of silence, then suddenly there was one prophecy from the prophet Malachi, given 400 years earlier, that there was going to be a messenger that was going to come before Messiah, right? 400 years later, who comes? John the Baptist. We talked about how 700 years before Mary gave birth, the prophet Isaiah prophesied, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Right? And Joseph and Mary experienced the connection themselves. They saw the Word of God become alive in their lives. It wasn't just something they were reading off and in a book. Those words, it was like they came off the pages and they became very real to them. 
Now they were living it. The same thing goes for the shepherds. Hundreds of years before, it's prophesied that Messiah will come and be born in Bethlehem. Epaphatha. Amen. Mikal, Mikal, Eder. And that's exactly where Jesus you, is born. And the shepherds rejoice because now they have a connection Amen. with the Christmas story. Yes. Amen. 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 The question is, do you have a connection with the Christmas story? Amen. It's very important that you understand that in order to be saved, you must believe on the Lord Jesus That's Christ. Right. Jesus says, whoever believes on me shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so, so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son into the world, that whoever believes on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Right? Amen. Believe, believe, believe. Oh, Pastor John, I believe. Really? Really? <laughs> Charles Blodden was a famous tightrope walker back in the 1800s. You may have heard this story before. But Charles Blodden decided he was going to put, I think it was 1,200 feet between American Niagara Falls and Canada. He put up this line and he began to walk across it. And he walked across one time and the people were cheering. Then he walked across a second time and he had a, uh, he would go there and like fix up weird things. Like sometimes he brought like a little, uh, I think it was like a little furnace out there too and he started to do eggs. And he went across another time on a bicycle. And then he got a, he got a wheelbarrow. And he went across, and people are going mad crazy. Then he comes back to the American side, and he says, How many of you believe that I can do this again? And everybody is screaming, We believe! We believe! And he says, How many of you really believe? He said, We believe. We've seen it. You can do this. He said, I need a volunteer. Get in. <laughs> I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. What does it really mean to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Right. It means to get in the wheelbarrow. Hallelujah. It means your whole life, your whole heart, everything that you are, you put it in the hands of Jesus and you say, no more control for me. Lord, you take control. You be the Lord now of my life. You take absolute, total control of me. Amen. Pastor, I believe. Yes. Get in the wheel. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And somebody say hello. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> hello. There you go. Today in the city of David, a Savior and a Liberator has been born for you. Amen. 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 And those last two words, for you, continue to echo on throughout the centuries and throughout the ages and will continue to do so until God comes here. Now, if you already know Jesus and you've experienced him, the question I have for you also is, are you doing what the shepherds did? They were spreading the story of what they had experienced. See, when you know Jesus, you cannot contain it because it's life inside of you. And you have to share it with individuals. When I got saved, my family looked at me like I lost a few up there and mm -hmm. don't have everything in the shed there, John. You're losing a couple there. A few, few, you know, loose screws. And went to my friends. They thought I went nuts too. Why? Because my life was radically, drastically, supernaturally changed by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were seeing love come out of me and not hate. Amen. They, they saw suddenly I was carrying a Bible and not a bat or a gun. Amazing, isn't it? Yes. How God can change and transform your life. <laughs> Radical transformation. Can somebody say hello? Hello. Oh, yeah. Amen. Can you stand with me, please? Musicians, if you can come up, please, as well. Oh, come, oh, come. Sending your son Jesus to Miguel. Miguel. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you for the sacrifice, Jesus, that you made. Thank you for the symbolism. Thank you, Lord God, for this great city. Thank you for the prophecies. Thank you that no human being could fulfill, Lord God, all of the prophecies that you've laid down in your word. And we thank you, Lord God, that those prophecies validate.
that you are God, that you, no one can do this, that no human being could write all this stuff and it come to pass, Lord God, centuries later. Impossible, Lord God. We thank you that it validates the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, that there is no other Savior, and that when we stand before you, Lord God, there is no excuse. Today's message, Lord God, proves that when we stand before you, we cannot escape the reality of what you have done for us. And so, Lord, I ask by the power of your Spirit that you would convict, that you would regenerate, that you would help individuals to cry out and say, I believe, and get into the wheelbarrow and commit their hearts and their lives completely over to you. Completely, Lord God. Not half-heartedly, but wholeheartedly. Lord, touch others who know you and who have experienced you. Lord God, help them and help us, help me, to be like those shepherds, Lord God, who went about spreading the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to every person who would hear. And Lord, we don't care what the reactions will be. This time here on earth is short. Lord, you can take us at any moment, Lord God. Our lives can be snuffed out. It's a vapor, Lord God, that is here for one moment and gone the next. So, Father, what is done for Christ will last, and we ask you, please, help us to put our hands to the plow, to move forward, not look back. But, Lord, help us to be good witnesses in these last days. May you be glorified, and we ask it in the name of of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. If you have to believe, please do so quietly as we worship the Lord. But the Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord grant you shalom and peace. The Lord re bring regeneration to your heart and your life that you would be born again by the engrafted word that is able to save your souls. Born again from above. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Can we worship the Lord just for a few more songs?